Hey everybody, it's Andy and welcome again to my office in Modesto, California. I'm an attorney licensed to practice law in California as well as New York. I, and in this video, I'm going to go over the three lists that I think you should make if you're considering putting together an estate plan. So uh, before I begin, actually, uh, I'm actually test driving a new microphone today. Uh, it's a Rode VideoMic Pro. Uh, so uh, the, hopefully this actually helps with the audio qualities that I've had in my other videos. Um, I've had prior Rode mics before. I've tried using lavalier mics also. And I still get either, um, you know, basically microphone feedback or I sound like I'm really far away, etc. Hopefully this microphone actually solves that problem. Uh, so I guess, you know, basically if you watch my other videos and you kind of hear hissing in the background and stuff, uh, that's actually a microphone feedback problem. Hopefully this microphone actually solves that finally. Uh, let me know in the comments down below if the audio actually works. So uh, anyway, that said, uh, in this video, I'm going to go over the three lists that I think you should make if you're considering putting together an estate plan. Um, the, I guess, kind of in general, I think it's a good idea for the average person to have an estate plan. Uh, if you don't have one and you pass away, for instance, you don't control what happens to your stuff, let's say. Uh, you don't control uh, basically you know, what happens to your family members, if you want to provide for your children, let's say. Uh, without an estate plan, you really don't have the ability to do that real well. And um, yeah, so basically, I mean, an estate plan is actually not that complicated to, uh, to make. And a lot of people want to make them, I think, but they don't know how to actually do it. Uh, like a, a really common kind of question that I receive is, Andy, I want to make an estate plan. Like, that's the extent of the question. Um, if you read between the lines, however, like what they're, ask, what they're actually asking is, I want to make an estate plan but I don't know how to do it, what's the first step? Uh, so to go on a bit of a history aside here, uh, I do, well, I have noticed actually, I don't have any data to back this up, like search data, let's say, but I have noticed that whenever famous people pass away, uh, for example, Steve Jobs back in 2011, or when the artist known as Prince passed away in 2016, I think, um, there was a spike, I guess, in interest in estate plans. Um, yeah, I mean, just, that's the way human nature is, I guess. So um, anyway, but you know, if you are wanting to make an estate plan, the three lists that I'm about to describe hopefully will be a um, kind of pointer in how you should actually go about doing it. So um, before that, I wanna make one disclaimer first. Uh, as with a lot of my videos, this video is gonna be California um, specific. Uh, so if you're in California, these three lists, I think are gonna be really helpful for you. Uh, if you are in other states or countries, not California, uh, I want to say that these lists will help you also because I think the logic behind them is universal. It's not California specific, um, you know, New York specific, etc. But these lists, I think, if you're going to use them in another state, for example, not California, um, you will most likely need to modify them slightly uh, to fit whatever requirements or needs uh, you know you have in what your state requires and so on. So slight modification uh, if you're outside California. Uh, yeah, I think that's all, all the kind of preamble stuff that I wanted to say. So let's get into the list. So list number one, I think, is going to be the list of all the assets that you have that you actually care about what happens to them. Uh, the list of assets that you have that you actually care about what happens to them. So um, the reason I put that part at the end there about like, you know, that you actually care about what happens to them is most people, uh, most people probably haven't thought about it but they actually own quite a bit of stuff. Like if you go through like, you know, your desk at home or your, you know, your garage at home, for example, you'll have pencils, staplers, you know, paper clips, screwdrivers on the, on the wall and so forth. Um, if you want to make your list that detailed to include, oh, five Phillips screwdrivers, you know, three Allen wrenches and stuff. Can you do that? Sure. Most of the time, however, that's probably not a good idea though, because if your list is too unwieldy, like it's too detailed, it actually gets really difficult to, um, like to work with. So what most people do is they actually just include the lists of items that are A, financially valuable, you know, their house, their Google stock, for example, uh, or they include stuff that is sentimentally valuable. So for instance, uh, you know, the shotgun that their father left them or, you know, the muscle car that they've had ever since they were a teenager or something. So uh, stuff like that uh, basically is what most people typically include on the list of assets. Other stuff like pencils, you know, staplers, toothpicks, that kind of thing. Um, if you really want to, I guess you can include them, but I think there's a risk that your, uh, that your list might get too unwieldy to, to kind of really use. Uh, what actually most people do, at least 
in my experience, kind of out west here in California. Uh, what most people do for stuff, or sorry, for assets rather, that is um, that are more kind of minor, you know, not real unique, is they basically d uh, distribute it by category. So, for instance, if we're talking about tools, instead of talking about specific screwdrivers or specific types of hammers, let's say, they'll just basically say, okay, all the tools that I have in my shed at home, I leave to my nephew, Steve. Or all the tools that I have in my garage at home, I leave to my neighbor, Bob, because he and I, you know, used to work on projects together. You know, I think it'd be really valuable for him to have those tools, let's say. Uh, so they basically, or the person who makes the estate plan, basically dispose of categories of assets uh, versus each individual asset by name. Uh, now, having said all of that, if you actually do want to dispose of all your screwdrivers individually or all your pencils individually, can you do that? Sure. I uh, certainly don't mean to dissuade you or say that you can't do it that way. Most people don't. Uh, most people generally include just you know financially valuable assets or assets that are sentimentally valuable in some way. That's all. So that's list number one. The list of all the assets that you have that you actually care about what happens to them. Uh, so list number two. List number two is the list of people uh, or institutions also uh, that you actually want to provide for. So think of it like the list of recipients for all the assets that you just described in list number one. So um, when I, I mean, I guess this list number two could include people, like I said, or it could include institutions like churches, temples, um, universities, you know, graduate schools that you went to, for example, you can provide for them also. Uh, when it comes to people, what most uh, persons who are making estate plans typically do is they leave stuff to their children, they leave stuff to their grandchildren, leave stuff to siblings, parents, you know, if they're still alive, for example. Um, so you can certainly do that. Uh, if you're leaving stuff to an institution like a church or a university, what I would recommend is going online to find out if your church, institution, you know, charity, whatever, actually has a pre-existing, or sorry, has an, has an established uh, procedure by which you can leave stuff to them in your will or your trust or something. A lot of big institutions, you know, you know, the Red Cross, for example, Stanford University, they generally will have, um, like, uh, I guess, sections on the website or departments, like special departments, that actually handle planned giving type stuff. Uh, and there's usually gonna be a procedure that they have that they kind of have, um, you know, refined, that they're really used to. If you follow that procedure, uh, your estate plan, generally speaking, is gonna be easier to create, more likely to be accurate, um, that, type, that kind of thing. So if you're, if you're planning on providing for an institution, look online, you know, do your research to see if there actually is a procedure in place that the institution has set up already. Uh, so as part of list number two, actually, I would also add that it's probably a good idea to specify who you want to receive what. So don't make list number two just a laundry list of items of, or sorry, list of people rather, who you want to receive things, like you list out your, you know, your, your kids, your nephew, you know, your friends, etc. Don't just list it out that way. List out those people, of course, those institutions, but also list out who you want to receive what. So, for instance, let's say that you know when your when your niece was 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 a child, you and she actually worked on your 1967 Eleanor Mustang, for example, uh, a lot. And you know, because you and she used to work on it, you know, you want her to receive that because that's you know something that hopefully you know she remembers you by. For for instance. Uh, if you and your nephew really liked um, being out on your boat together, you know, leave your boat to your nephew. If you have a child, for example, who works in nonprofit or who's a teacher or something who, you know, in terms of income, maybe they're struggling a little bit, leave them your house because your other kids, you know, they, they're really well off financially, they can buy their own houses, but one child, for example, just needs your help in terms of having a place to live. So that type of stuff, if you want to include that in, in list number two, uh, I think that'd be a really good idea. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's list number two. A list of people, or probably recipients is the better word here, a list of recipients uh, that you want to actually receive the assets that you described in list number one, uh, and also include a list in list, sorry, include a designation rather in list number two about who you want to receive what. Uh, so that's list, list number two. List number three is going to be the list of people who you have that will be available to fill the various job functions uh, that you have in an estate plan. So um, I guess if it wasn't clear from before, an estate plan has various documents in it, 
a will, a trust, possibly several trusts, uh, a power of attorney, an advanced healthcare directive, and so on. So those types of documents are actually going to be um, kind of common, I guess, to most estate plans. Uh, each of those documents, generally speaking, will require at least one um, kind of job function to be filled. So for instance, if you have a will, um, there's a function called an executor that needs to be filled. Uh, the best way I can describe this, I guess, is that if you think about, uh, think about rather, think about TV shows, uh, movies and stuff where somebody has died and everybody's gathered in the lawyer's office at the end, you know, dressed in, you know, really somber funeral attire for the reading of the will. A lot of times that lawyer who actually reads the will is the executor and his or her job responsibility is to make sure that, um, well, like all the assets that the deceased person had are actually distributed in the way that the will specifies, for instance. So if you have a will, you're going to need somebody to be an executor. Um, if you have a living trust, let's say, uh, out west here in California, it's actually really common for people to have a living trust. Other types of trusts are possible also, but living trust, at least in California here, are the most common type, I think. Um, if you have a living trust, or any trust basically, you're going to need somebody to be the trustee. Uh, so their job is to basically be, um, I guess, basically to, to, to step into your shoes, to do the things that you would normally do had you been around, I suppose. That's probably the best way to put it. So if you wanted your, um, your house to be held in trust for the benefit of your, you know, of your niece or your, your minor children or something, the trustee's job is basically to make sure that that happens, to make sure that the trust is fulfilled, all the things that you specified are actually done. So um, you're gonna need somebody to, to be the role of trustee. If you have an advanced healthcare directive, um, you know, you're gonna need somebody to be your, your agent for that. If you have a power of attorney, you're gonna need somebody to be your agent for that also. So um, speaking of advanced healthcare directives and powers of attorney, I actually have other videos on my channel about each of those. So um, I'm gonna to try to link those up, up in, the, in the corner here. But if I can't, I'm gonna go ahead and link, link them down in the description also. So uh, check down in the description if you wanna see those videos. Um, speaking of videos, actually, I also have ones on, I want to say, how to create a will in California, as well as how to make sure a will created in another state is valid in California, I think. Um, yeah, check, check the, the description down below for all those other videos. So, for each of the um, components, rather, of an estate plan, you're generally speaking going to need a uh, person, or possibly two people, uh, to fill in the various job functions that those documents require. It's also a really good idea to have several people lined up to fill each of those job functions. So for instance, if you create your will and you name one person as executor, it's a good idea to have several backup people named also. So the idea is that when you actually pass away, hopefully years and years kind of down the road from when you actually created your will, um, you know, the executor that you name, maybe nobody can find them. Maybe they've disappeared. Maybe they've died before you. Uh, that's always a possibility also. So um, if the named executor or the named trustee or the named power of attorney agent can't serve, can't be found and so forth, uh, it's a good idea to have backup people also. So if the primary person can't be found, you go to the backup. If the backup person has died also, you go to the second backup and the third backup and so on. So uh, to have multiple people in those job functions also is going to be really helpful. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, you know, again, to summarize real quickly, hopefully, the list that I think you should make, number one, is a list of all the assets that you have that you care about in terms of financial value, uh, sentimental value, for example. Number two is a list of all the recipients who you want to leave your assets to uh, and also include a list, uh, like include in that list a designation of who you want to receive what item. Uh, and if you're leaving stuff to institutions like a school or a church or a charity or something, uh, check online to make sure that you know you follow whatever procedure you know the institution or the the church or the university has. Uh, generally speaking, following their procedure is going to make your estate plan a lot easier to kind of create and handle. And number three, finally, is that you know you need to have a list of all the people that you want to serve in job functions. Uh, so, for example, executor of your will, trustee of your trust, um, power of attorney agent for your power of attorney, and so on. Uh, good idea. It's a good idea also to have several people named to fill each of those job functions, uh, just in case, for instance, your trustee dies before you, or your executor has disappeared, or you know your power of attorney agent has to resign, or something. Um, it's a good idea to have backup people named as well. 
So um, that's it. Hopefully those three lists are helpful and they kind of set you on the right track if you have no idea how to create an estate plan. Uh, again, this video is, is specific to California, but I'm hoping that the, the logic, the kind of common sense um, kind of thought process that I described for each of those three lists uh, are going to apply in other states, possibly other, excuse me, possibly other countries also. So uh, if I have left anything off, you know, for lists that would apply in other countries, go ahead and leave me a comment down below, for example. And um, yeah, I'm always interested in finding out how law works in other places. So again, hopefully all that helps. Go ahead and, you know, share, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. And I will talk to you guys in the next video. Thanks.